Well, if you have your Bible, why don't you turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 4. Uh, We're continuing on in our series looking at the life of Solomon. And as you turn there, let me just pray for us. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for this morning. Father, we thank you for this time that we have together as your people. And God, even though we can't all be together in the same place, we thank you for those who can be here. And we thank you for those who are joining us now online as well. Uh, Father, we pray that wherever people are this morning, both physically and, and in their hearts, that you would meet with them where they are. God, I pray that you would just speak to us clearly through your word. Father, that it would change our lives, that it would change us from the inside out. That we wouldn't leave today the same as we came. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to start by asking you a question, and uh, we'll see your response. Do you remember the good old days? Now, when I ask that question, how many of you guys immediately kind of think of, you know, some time in your life that are the good old days? And, and maybe for, for different people it's different. Maybe for you, as soon as I said the good old days, your mind went back maybe even a few decades. And you were thinking of a specific time in your life. Maybe it was, uh, maybe it was during school, in your college years. Maybe it was high school. Maybe it was raising a family. But you look back on that time and you say, those were the good old days. Uh, maybe for some of you, it's kind of quite recent times that you look back on as a good old days. And maybe you're fairly young today, and you're kind of thinking to yourself, I'm not sure I've experienced the good old days yet, but I'm hoping to in the future. Uh, whatever the case for you, I think you'd agree that whether or not you always are, are reminiscing on the days gone by, it's pretty common for people to look back on the way things were and to just kind of look with this kind of optimism and say, you know, things were better back then. Uh, we do this in all kinds of ways in, in different contexts. I remember working at a Christian camp when I was younger. And the, when I was working at this Christian camp, I was in my teens and, and we were, I was kind of younger. And I remember it was just really difficult at that time for a lot of Christian camps in the area. Uh, the costs of everything were going up. So the cost of insurance was going up. The cost of food was going up. The cost of all these different rentals that we had to do was going up. And also it seemed at the same time, the interest in Christian summer camp was kind of declining in our area. Uh, Fewer and fewer families were sending their kids to camp, and so you had this situation where some weeks we couldn't actually fill up all the cabins that were available. And I remember some people on staff talking about the times when things were different. They talked about times when every single cabin was filled every single week. They talked about when the cost of camp was just a fraction of the price it was now. They talked about the waiting lists of people just waiting to get in if it was an open spot. They said those were the good old days. Later in my life when I went to Bible college, I I was enjoying many meals in the cafeteria. And I remember thinking, oh, the cafeteria's got some great meals, they got some good food. And and then I was told by some older students and some staff members that had kind of stayed on after their time of study, and they said, well, you think this is good. Back in the good old days, they used to serve soft-serve ice cream at every single dinner. They used to have fries at every single meal. They said those were the good old days. And for us here today, maybe some of us are thinking, back in a time when this sanctuary didn't just have 30 people, it had 300 people. And this place was packed out, and when we sang together, the voices just filled the auditorium, filled the sanctuary, and we got to visit beforehand, and we had Sunday school, and afterwards we got to visit with people, and we invited someone over to our house for an afternoon meal, And we'd say, well, those are the good old days. And I don't think it's wrong to look back on the past and be thankful for it, to talk about the good old days, whatever those those mean for us. And I think as long as we're not living in the past or or kind of looking in the past with this, you know, rose-colored glasses and pretending everything was perfect when when it wasn't, I think it's important for us to be thankful for the good days that are in the past and look forward to better ones in the future. In our sermon series that we began at the beginning of this month, we've been looking at the life of Solomon. And Solomon's life kind of, or his life has started, but his ministry and his reign has started kind of with some ups and downs. Uh, We've seen Solomon establishing his kingdom and some of the events going on in terms of him taking the throne. And there's been some challenges, there's been some great things. But today as we get into chapter 4, we're going to look at a period of time that many people call the golden age of the nation. This is the period of time in chapter 4 where future generations would look back and they would say, those were the good old days. Last week we looked at the events leading up to this chapter 4, and in chapter 3, God appears to Solomon and God says to Solomon, ask for whatever you want me to give you. 
this great moment in Solomon's life where his whole reign is ahead of him and he has the option to ask God for whatever he wants. And Solomon says, God, would you give me an understanding mind to govern this great people? And God enjoys Solomon's request and he says, Solomon, I'm going to give you an understanding mind. I'm also going to give you riches and I'm going to give you honor. And God gives those things to Solomon. Chapter 3 ends with Solomon displaying his newfound wisdom in in a specific case with two women and their children. But in chapter 4, we now see Solomon's wisdom as it's applied to the whole nation in general. Ian Proven writes this, he says, It's the sort of kingdom one would expect when a king has been gifted by God to rule. In other words, you can imagine Solomon's going to receive wisdom from God to rule a great nation. You can imagine the results of that are going to be incredible. And we read some amazing statements about how amazing things were, but before we do, we hear a little bit of the structure of Solomon's government and his reign to make these things possible. Uh, We start now in 1 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 1, as we read the names of the people within Solomon's government. So, so, So King Solomon ruled over all Israel, and these were his chief officials. Azariah, son of Zadok, the priest. Elihoreph and Ahijah, sons of Shisha, secretaries. Jehoshaphat, son of Elihud, Recorder, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, commander in chief, Zadok and Abiathar, priests, Azariah, son of Nathan, in charge of the district governors, Zabad, son of Nathan, a priest and advisor to the king, Ahishar, palace administrator, Adoniram, son of Abda, in charge of forced labor. Solomon had twelve district governors over all Israel, who supplied provision for the king and the royal household. Each one had to provide supplies for one month in the year. These are their names. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim. Ben-Decker in Mekaz, Shalbim, Beth Shemesh in Elon, Beth Hanan. Ben-Hesed in Arubath, Saka in all the land of Hefer were his. Ben-Abinadab in Naphoth-Dor. He was married to Taphath, daughter of Solomon. Bana, son of Ahilad in Tanakh in Megiddo in all of Ben-Shah next to Zarephath below Jezreel. And Beth Shar and to Ebel Halath across to Jachmin. Ben Gibur and Ramath Gilead, the settlements of Jer, son of Mahanas, and Gilead were his, as well as the region of Argob and Bashan, and its sixty large walled city with bronze gate bars. Ahinadab, son of Ido, and Menahim, Ahimaz, and Naphtali, he married Basimoth, daughter of Solomon, Bana, son of Hushai, and Asher, and Alath. Jehoshaphat, son of Parua and Issachar, Shimei, son of Ella and Benjamin, Yeber, son of Uri and Gilead, the country of Sion, king of the Amorites, and the country of Og, king of Bashan. He was the only governor over the district. Whew, okay. Just a word to any fathers out there of teenage daughters. If you ever have your teenage daughter bring home a, a boy that she's interested in him, and you want to intimidate them a little bit, just have them read this passage for, this, for the family at dinner time, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure he'll know who's in charge in the household. But uh, I'm going to be honest, I wrestled this week with whether or not to read through all the names that are here. And the first reason is obvious, because I was scared of butchering a bunch of these names in front of you, and that's already happened, but uh, I got over that. Uh, the other reason is because I know any time a person stands up and reads a bunch of names in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament where we're maybe less familiar with these people, it's really easy for our minds to start to wander. Right? You're hearing all these people that you don't know who they are, all these places you don't know where they are, and it's easy for us to kind of just tune ourselves out a little bit and let our minds wander. So if, if that's happened to you, I invite you to kind of come back and, and re-engage right now, and I'll tell you why I did read through all of these names. A couple of reasons, but the main one is this. I want us to really see how important it is that each of these individuals is involved in what's going on in the government. Right? If you think about the, this, the nature of what's going on here, Solomon's a king that God has given great wisdom and great understanding to rule over this nation. And Solomon realizes that part of having wisdom is actually putting people in place to reign alongside of him, to rule alongside of him. See, sometimes I think there's a temptation in, in our lives, and maybe, you know, this is just certain personalities, so maybe you'll relate, maybe you won't, but sometimes it's, we kind of have this feeling in our, in our hearts of like, well, I'll just do it myself, right? And, and rather than taking the time to train someone or to kind of bring someone on, on board, I'll, I'll just do it myself and it will be easier that way. 
And when you look at Solomon, if there was ever a person who could argue that he could do it all himself, if there was ever a person who could kind of argue, well, nobody knows how to do it like me, nobody else can understand the way I understand, it would be Solomon who could argue that. And again, Solomon, though, understands that part of being wise and ruling with, the, with wisdom means actually putting people and systems in place so that they can succeed and they can all contribute to the greater good. I think this is a good reminder for us in a couple of ways. And first of all, just kind of back to the song we sang earlier this morning, He Knows My Name. We serve a God that isn't just concerned with kings, He's concerned with individuals. He knows our name. And, and of course, the video tied in so nicely as well. God loves you. He created you unique. And so there's this kind of aspect here when we see all these names listed, we're, we're reminded of the fact that God knows all these people and all these people contribute to what's going on. Now, we see this in the church as well as we enter into ministry as the body of Christ. Every single member of the body is important. And it's not just about a few people that do everything and everyone else kind of watches. The body of Christ functions properly when everybody is contributing the gifts that they've been giving, the time that they've been giving, the talents, the, the treasure that they've been giving for the sake of the ministry. Pastors, elders, ministry leaders, they all have their role, but part of that role is to equip the saints, to equip everyone else for the work of ministry. One of the things I've come to love about Salem is there's so many people that recognize this truth, that this isn't just something that the paid staff or the pastors do, this is something that we all do together in ministry. Everyone is needed and everyone is important. And Solomon, in his wisdom, realizes that even though he's the wisest man to ever live, his wisdom means he's actually going to empower other people to carry out the government. And we see this as a very good decision as we see the results in verse 20. This is what it says. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, and they were happy. We'll pause here for a second. I love that phrase. They ate, they drank, and they were merry. Sometimes we have phrases we use in everyday life. We don't realize they actually kind of had their roots in Scripture. And we see these amazing phrases. Israel is called as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Now, if, if you kind of ever do some research in this, I was kind of looking some of this stuff up a little bit to see, can we even estimate what this might be like? And I found out very quickly, no, you can't estimate the sand on the se seashore because if you take just a one meter by one meter by one meter cube of sand, depending on the size of the grains, depending on how well compacted it is, all these factors go into it. But people estimate that you have, in just that one meter cube of sand, around one billion grains of sand. Now normally when we read scripture, we want to read it literally. There are places, however, when the author uses a figure of speech to make a point, and that's what's happening here. The point is that Israel has become a nation so numerous that you can't count them. And talking about the sand on the seashore is a way of kind of picturesquely putting that reality so that people won't forget it. But what it also does is it does something else that reminds us of something previous in Scripture that has already been said. Back in the book of Genesis, when God is talking to Abram about the great nation that will come from him, God says these words in Genesis chapter 22, uh, verse 17. He says to Abraham, I will surely bless you, and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. See, God had promised Abraham that a nation would come from him that would be as numerous as the sand on the seashore. And now we read that Israel has become as numerous as the sand on the seashore. What we're seeing here, in other words, is at least the beginning of the fulfillment of the promises that God made to Abraham. We see this in a number of other ways as well. In Genesis 12, verse 2, God told Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And again, if you compare that with what we just read, where it says the people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, and they were happy. It's a really great match in terms of what God had promised and what Israel is now experiencing. Uh, we see this in, in other ways as well. As we keep reading in verse 21, it says, And Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. These countries brought tribute and were Solomon's subjects all his life. That description of the border of the promised land corresponds to what God said to Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 18. It says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, 
and said to your descendants, I give this land from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Once again, we see that language of promise and God coming through on what he's promised. And we see this in all kinds of ways. Abraham's descendants, they become a great nation. They're living in the promised land. Their, their borders are larger than they've ever been before. They have peace on all sides. And they're experiencing God's rich blessings. And what's amazing is we still have a ways to go in this chapter as the author describes Solomon's wealth, his wisdom, and his honor. Let's keep reading in verse 22. Solomon's daily provisions were 30 cores of the finest flour and 60 cores of meal, 10 head of stall-fed cattle, 20 of pasture-fed cattle, and 100 sheep and goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roebucks, and choice fowl. For he ruled over all the kingdoms west of the Euphrates rivers from Tishba to Gaza and had peace on all sides. This is one of those places in, in Scripture where you're just trying to wrap your head around how in the world could this be the provisions for Solomon? Not for a month, not for a week, but for one day. These are Solomon's daily provisions. And, and when you look at this, it's just an incredible amount of food here. And if you have any background in farming, you'll be able to appreciate some of the scope of this. But even if you've just done some hunting, uh, you know what it, it, what it looks like when you slaughter one animal and how long that lasts in your deep freeze. And here you read about all these animals, all this wheat and flour that Solomon has just for one day. Now, based on what we know about Solomon's wives and concubines and the number of people in his household, this starts to make a bit more sense. Scholars estimate that this is enough food to feed around 14,000 people per day. Now, whether or not that's the actual number, we don't know, but we know whatever number it was, they were well provided for. In other words, this isn't just enough food to get by. This is more than enough food. It's ample provision. This is the table of a very wealthy king. And it makes sense because God told Solomon, Solomon, I'm going to make you not only wise, but you're also going to have riches and honor. And this is something for us to think about because one of the interesting dynamics that that promise from God introduced is that on the one hand, God had told the kings of Israel not to acquire much gold or silver. And yet on the other hand, we see that Solomon is told that he's going to be a rich king. And the question is, well, how can these two things go together? And I think it's in this text that we begin to see the answer that Solomon's riches don't consist of just gold or silver. They come in the form of provisions and food that he can actually share with his entire household. So usually when we think of a rich king, we, we think of the king who's in his, in his treasure room and he's counting stacks of gold and he's counting all his money and the people outside are, are starving and the people are poor and, and it's basically a rich king over against this impoverished people. And yet, in the case of Solomon, at least at the beginning of his reign, his riches and his wealth spill out to the rest of the nation. We see this in verse 25 as it describes not just what Solomon's table is like, but the situation of everybody in the land. It says this, During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel from Dan to Beersheba lived in safety, everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. It says Judah and Israel, later these nations would be separate, but now they're together as one nation. It's a way of saying everybody is living like this. From Dan to Beersheba. Now Dan was the northernmost kind of point in the nation. Beersheba is the southernmost point in the nation. So it's basically the way that we would say in Canada, from coast to coast to coast. Right? It's a way of saying both the extremes and everything in between, from Dan to Beersheba, everybody's living this life. And it says this, everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. Now, obviously, this is a phrase that we don't use quite as much as they did back in the Bible times. But a vine is a way of talking about the provision of drink, a fig tree, the provision of food. It's a way of saying everyone lived under God's blessing, having a degree of economic prosperity and independence. It's a way of saying the needs of everybody was, were met, and even then some. In fact, this phrase, everyone under their vine and under their fig tree, it's taken up later by the prophets of God's people. When the prophet Micah is looking forward to the day of restoration, when he's looking forward to the day when the mountain of the Lord will be established as the highest of all mountains, in Micah chapter 4, verse 4, he writes this, everyone in those days will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. 
shows us how amazing things were under Solomon's reign, that later the prophets would use that same language to talk about the days of restoration when God would restore the fortunes of his people. Read a quote that says, Solomon's economic arrangements were not oppressive, and his subjects were happy and prosperous under his rule. And I think it's, it's not an exaggeration or it's not a, a leap in the dark to say that for generations to come, they would look back on this time and they would say, when Solomon began to reign with the wisdom that God gave him, those were the good old days. But one of the things we see that even though these are the good old days, not everything was perfect. And sometimes we have that tendency to look back on times in our life that were, that were really good times in our life, and we kind of have these rose-colored glasses, and we say, well, no, everything was just amazing at that time, and there was nothing that was bad. Uh, there was no struggles, we didn't have any stress, there was no challenges that we faced, it was just all good all the time. And usually, if we're honest, that's not always the case to how things actually were. That's not the case here with Solomon either. There's a lot of great things going on, but there's also some things that we notice that are a little bit troubling. And I'll show you an example in verse 26. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for chariot horses and 12,000 horses. The district governors each in his month supplied provision for King Solomon and all who came to the king's table. They saw to it that nothing was lacking. They also brought to the proper place their quotas of barley and straw for the chariot horses and the other horses. Now, I think it's, it's possible that I read that and you're saying, what, what's wrong with that description? And we might miss anything being wrong if we weren't paying attention to Deuteronomy chapter 17. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned that Deuteronomy 17 is a place where God laid out the laws for the kings of Israel. And there's a few things that God told them. He said, don't acquire many wives, lest you be led astray. Don't acquire much gold or silver. And finally, he said, don't acquire many horses. It was a way of God saying to the king, you're not to put your trust in horses and the machines of war, you're to trust in me. Now, if we were just reading this without that background in mind, we'd say, well, yeah, this is just another description of Solomon's wealth. He's got a bunch of horses. This is a really good thing. But, of course, God has told the king, don't acquire many horses. Uh, Ian Proven writes this. I think it's a really good assessment of the situation. He says, once more, as if to bring us down to earth in the midst of this heavenly picture of the great king and his kingdom, the author drops into the text something of a time bomb. It is a bomb that will tick away quietly along with all others in 1 Kings 1 to 11 until the combined explosion occurs in chapters 11 to 12. And I love what he says here because when you read through this again, it's not like this big explosive detail. It's more of this quiet, soft ticking that's just kind of in the background. But we've seen this before with the first mention that Solomon entered into a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Israel, or king of Egypt. Right? It's, just, it's this detail that we kind of read, and then we read a whole bunch of good stuff, so we kind of forget about that one detail. Uh, we read about Solomon worshiping the high places, and that kind of sets us off, but no, then there's a lot of other good stuff at the same time. We read this description of all these horses that Solomon has acquired, but there's so much good around it, we kind of lose sight of it, and it's kind of this slow ticking that just kind of keeps ticking away in the background until eventually in chapter 11 and chapter 12, we see Solomon's downfall. And if we're just kind of reading it not very carefully, we say, well, chapter 11, chapter 12, they come out of nowhere. They're just kind of this, this massive explosion of sin all of a sudden, but we see, no, there's been this ticking of this time bomb leading up to it. And you see clues in Solomon's life that things are kind of heading in this direction. We'll see more of these clues as we continue to read. But again, for now, the good overwhelms the bad. And we continue to hear about things going on in Solomon's reign. Uh, we'll keep reading in verse 29. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight, and a breadth of understanding as measureless as a sand on the seashore. Again, a fitting detail here that just as Israel is as numerous as the sand on the seashore, Solomon's wisdom is now as great as the sand on the seashore. Uh, the author continues to pile up praise for Solomon's wisdom on uh, verse 30 and following. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east, and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt, he was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan, the Ezraite, wiser than Heman, Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. 
He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. So just as God told Solomon, Solomon, you're going to receive wisdom, you're going to receive riches, and you're going to receive honor, we've seen now that Solomon has, in fact, received all those different things. And what's so amazing is that the other nations, the other kings of the nations, they're seeing this and they're paying attention and they're sending people to actually learn from Solomon and to be influenced by this great nation. And I think this is a really important detail for us to consider because so often in Israel's history, that's not how things went. See, often in Israel's history, what would happen is when Israel was kind of where they were, they would look at the nations around them and Israel would say, well, look at all these nations with all their gods, with all their, their practices, with all the, you know, these people. Let's be influenced by them. Let's join them. Let's do what they're doing. And Israel is so often led astray by these other nations. And yet here we see it's the opposite where the other nations are looking at Israel and they're saying, we want to learn from you. We see your wisdom. We see what you're doing. We want to be not led astray, but led into the light by what's going on here. So often the nations were a snare for Israel. So often the nations were led astray. But the way that God actually designed it was for his people to be a light to the nations. We see, of course, that this didn't always happen. But but the idea was that Israel was blessed to be a blessing. They were rescued from slavery in Egypt. God brought them out into the promised land. But before he did that, he brought them to Mount Sinai where he entered into a covenant relationship with them. And he gave them the law. He said, you don't need to guess about who I am. I'm going to show you who I am. You don't need to guess about what I require of you. I'm going to lay that all out for you. And I'm going to lay out these laws for your flourishing. Israel's then brought into the promised land. They're given a king. And they're given peace on all sides. They're given all these gifts by God. They're blessed, though, to be a blessing. To be a light to all these other nations. Now, Moses explains this in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5 to 8. He says, See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations, who will hear about these decrees and say, Surely this nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near to them the way the the Lord our God is near to us whenever we pray to them? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? The nations were supposed to look at Israel and say, something is different here. They have wise laws. They have a God who is so near to them, not like our gods who who don't listen to us when we call out to them and we do all these things to try to get their attention. They have a God who hears their prayers and is near to them. Now, oftentimes, this is not what the nations said when they saw Israel, but here in the early reign of Solomon, as the nations observe this nation of Israel with all the wisdom that Solomon has been given, they start to say things like this. In fact, in chapter 5, Hiram, the king of Tyre, he speaks to Solomon, and listen to what he says to him. He says, Praise be the Lord today, for he has given David a wise son to rule over this great nation. Praise be to the Lord. This isn't just a generic expression. Hiram saying, praise be to Yahweh. Praise be to the God of Israel who has given David a wise son over this great nation. In other words, this foreign king, this king of another nation is looking at what's happening in Israel and he's saying, praise be to the God of Israel because he has done great things with this nation. This is one of the times when Israel is functioning the way that God has called them to as a light to the nations. In coming chapters, we'll see God command Solomon to build the temple, and we'll see God's presence in the temple. And again, it will be a reminder to the nations that God is present with his people to hear their prayers. Now, as we close off our time this morning, I want to think about together how this applies to us. See, as Israel was called to be a light to the nations, we also are called to be a light. But it's in some ways the same and in some ways different in terms of how this calling is operated. When we look at Israel, Israel was called to be a light to the nations, but what that looked like for them was to be a nation set apart, living 
by themselves over against these other nations who had kind of looked on in from the outside to see what Israel was doing. We see it's very uncommon in the Old Testament for missionaries to be sent out. In fact, we probably all think of Jonah right away, but Jonah is very much an exception as a one who goes to these other nations to preach the message of God. But so often Israel is called just to be a light to the nation, living as a people set apart. Now when we think about our own situation, again, there's similarities and there's differences. There's differences in terms of the fact that for us, we send missionaries out to the nations. We don't just kind of all stay here and say people will, will observe. We send missionaries out into places where people have never even heard the name of God. Where, where the name of Christ has not even been mentioned. We say, let's go into the nations and let's infiltrate and let's bring the message of the kingdom of God to those who need to hear it the most. And of course, there's similarities as well. We're still called to be a people set apart. Although for us, being set apart doesn't mean we all live in the same location. It means we're a people in the world, but not of the world set apart in terms of being different from the world around us. Living in the midst of the pain, living in the midst of the brokenness and all the hurting, and yet remaining, if we can, unstained by the world around us. And part of this means, of course, our, our testimony to the world, even though we send missionaries, even though we share the gospel with our words, part of this means we share the gospel and we spread the light of Christ by the way we live together as believers. What I want us to think about this morning is what would it look like if as a church we lived in such a way that the world around us looked and said, what an amazing thing we have going on here. Now, this is something we've never seen before. This is a people who have a God so near to them. This is a people who live wisely based on the commands of the Bible. Now some of you here maybe are thinking, well, is it? I don't, I don't think people would actually ever say that when they look at the church. Uh, and you might say that there's so many people who are so diametrically opposed to what we believe and what we stand for, and they're, they're so opposed to the Word of God that what could we ever do that would make them change their minds about all these different topics that they are so passionate about? And I'd say that's a good question because it's true. When you look at the world around us, there's a lot of people who would look at the church and without really giving a second thought say, I don't want anything to do with these people. I don't agree with what they believe in. I don't, believe, I don't agree with the stands that they take on certain issues. I, I certainly don't think they're a loving people or a nice people or anything like that. I'm just opposed to what they're doing. But here's something I want us to consider. What would it look like for us to live our lives in front of the watching world in such a way that when people look at the church, they say something like this. Even though I don't agree with what they believe, even though I think they're dead wrong on this issue and this issue and this issue, even though I don't like what they stand for, I can't deny that they love one another. I can't deny that if I was in trouble, they would be the first people that would, would come to help me. I can't deny that they're the most generous people in our community. I can't deny that if I needed someone to be there, they would be there. I can't deny that they conduct themselves in their business world with integrity and with honesty. I can't deny that they're a great neighbor. I can't deny that I trust them. You see, there's some things that we can't control. We can't change people's beliefs. That's the, the job of the Holy Spirit. We can't change people's hearts. But what we can do is live, in a life, that, live life in a way together that makes people notice there's something different here. That makes them maybe second guess and say, I, I need to ask some questions. I need to consider what is causing this people to live so differently. But like Israel, it doesn't happen automatically. Just because we're, we go to church on a Sunday doesn't mean this is going to, it only happens if we follow Jesus on the path of discipleship. Walking as he walked, when we stumble, getting up and asking for forgiveness and keep persevering on the road He's called us to. We've been blessed to be a blessing, to live lives in a way that points others to Jesus. And so let's ask God for help to do that this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You are a God, that You call us to be Your people. And God, we thank You that You've entrusted us with the message of reconciliation. Reconciliation. 
that we are ambassadors for you. And Father, we thank you that we have the freedom and we have the responsibility to, to send missionaries around the world. Father, we thank you for that good work that we are able to do. And then we think of missionaries that have been sent from Salem that are currently in the field. And Father, I pray that you would raise up more missionaries from in our midst. Men and women who would look at the call and say, I want to give my life for the sake of the gospel. God, would you send me where you want me? I'm ready to go. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have here in Waltheim and in this area to be your church and to shine the light of the gospel where we live. God, I pray that you would help us to live in a way that even when people disagree with what we stand for, what we believe in, and just who are just so opposed to the church, I pray that they would not be able to deny the love that we have. So God, we ask for your help to live lives that point people to your great love in Christ Jesus. Father, we know that left to our own devices, we can't do this. In our own strength, we will fail every time. So we pray for the help of your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for attitudes of humility to ask for forgiveness where we failed and to keep stepping forward in obedience day after day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.